Okay, so good afternoon everybody and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the research we've been doing and plan to do in the future in Alto and this is the, our theme and our group which is surfaces and interfaces at the nanoscale and I just quickly point out for those of you who have read the Finnish and Swedish versions we're not yet ready for user interfaces at the nanoscale but I'll, I'll think about it and let you know. Okay, so first of all, surfaces and interfaces, why should we care about them? So this is, I mean, there is a huge amount of applications and technologies that rely on the properties of the surface and the interface over anything else. But I've just selected a few here, which represent things that we've worked on or that we are working on. Uh, particular, uh, sort of relevant as winter approaches is friction and where, so we spend a lot of time trying to understand how the properties of uh, frictional contacts between surfaces or interfaces depends on their atomic structure and how can we optimize this, uh, come up with better technologies, lubricants, coatings. The two related topics uh, on the left and top right hand sides which are about catalysis. So we spend a lot of time working with people in industry on uh, ca catalytic materials and trying to find new catalytic materials. So particularly nanoscale catalytic materials, which are both more efficient, cheaper and less harmful uh, than the ones that are currently available. And similarly related to the new energy economy, if you like, and aspects of it like producing hydrogen, we spend a lot of time trying to optimize materials for getting hydrogen from water in a cheap and efficient, man efficient manner. And all of this is related to understanding surface properties. In parallel to this, which is more related to interface science, we spend a lot of time looking at micro and nano electronics. So on the bottom right hand side you see a chip and this chip already contains, I wouldn't like to say, uh, the, the results of our research but we played a very small part in the actual materials that now Intel uses in modern computer chips and this is the idea that we need to replace the, the silicon, silicon dioxide system which is in all modern transistors and electronics devices with something newer, something better that can keep our computers you know, along this Moore's law of getting faster and faster. Now, of course, we can't just keep doing the same stuff and eventually we need new computational architectures. In the bottom left, you see an artist's impression of so-called molecular electronics. So here we're looking at the properties of molecules on surfaces and trying to understand how they could replace the simple switches we have in modern computers with much more nanoscale designs. That is, in a way, why we do it and the, the next slide it tells how we go about doing that. And here I talk about um, a circle of steps and you can enter a problem or challenge, can enter any point on this circle. But the conventional way is that the experimentalists or technologists have some observable, some result, which they think is very interesting, but they don't necessarily understand it, understand what's going on at the atomic scale. And they will then come to us and say, can you explain this? So we, we see this picture. Can you tell us what is really going on? And so we try and build a model and the first thing that normally happens is we notice that our tools are not sufficient. So the, the tools we've been using for the past five years no longer solve the problem. We have to invent new tools. We have to go away, do some development, some coding um, to come up with new tools. And once we have those tools, then we sit back and relax and let the computers do the work and produce our results, which hopefully will make the experimentalists happy. But normally the cycle goes again, that we find something new, some new problem, some new materials, and this continues as new technologies and new challenges, challenges face us every year. Okay, I mentioned tools, and I'm very briefly going to just mention a few, for maybe for some of the specialists in the audience. So I would describe the group as um, a multi-scale simulations group, so we're not focused on one particular tool. So we use uh, quantum and classical approaches, depending on what type of system we're interested in. We look at equilibrium systems, uh, non-equilibrium systems, depending on whether they matter. If we're interested in temperature, we can run molecular dynamics. If we're interested in statistics, we can run things like Monte Carlo. And we have, through the years, used all the way from electronic, looking at electrons, atoms, up to coarse grain models based on particles, all the way to continuum models, which don't have discrete elements underlying their model. And I would say the one thing that we are perhaps, um, or one of our strengths, 
is we try and break down the barriers between technologists and experimentalists and simulation people by building computational experiments. So we find there's often a lot of barriers between presenting our numbers as they are raw to the experimentalists and the same when they present their numbers to us. So we very often build microscopes within our computer. We build experiments in the computer and this means we can show the same sort of data to the experimentalists which greatly aids interpretation and understanding. And I, I pick one set of experiments just to sort of highlight some of the things we do. And we are surface and interfaces at the nanoscale, which means we normally want to know where the atoms are, if not the electrons. But let's stick with the atoms. And if you stick into Google seeing atoms, you find lots of nice pictures, and in fact you can see atoms without getting into too many details. And the way you can see atoms is using this family of tools called scanning probe microscopy, which is very, very powerful microscopes, which can really use different sources other than light to see atoms in surfaces, atoms at interfaces. And if we want to see atoms, we normally partner up then with experimental groups who are experts in this from Finland and all around the world. And there is two favorite techniques within this scanning probe that we've worked on, which is the so-called atomic force microscopy, which is really measuring the difference in force over atoms in surfaces. Simple as that. Scanning tunneling microscopy, you're measuring the difference in tunneling current how electrons tunnel differently over different atoms in the surface. And both of these give you extremely highly resolved, atomically resolved images of surfaces and interfaces. Beyond this, uh, we have more recently started to work with something called Kelvin Probe. But this is just something which shows you the electrostatic potential of a surface. So you can really see how a surface or the atoms behave as a function of applying a voltage across the system. And very briefly, we have one example of this which basically the experimentalists had a, uh, a step, an atomic, de atomically defined step, and they applied a voltage to the system and saw enormous changes in the electrostatic potential. And they assumed that there was something very big going on, some, some defects, some impurities. And we actually showed that basically if you moved an atom by a few tenths of a picometer on the surface, you could reproduce this, this experimental effect very straightforwardly. And no one before had been able to see such small displacements in a, in a surface. I mentioned friction and dissipation. So we have done some work directly on friction, but we've also done a lot of work on something which is a little bit uh, more complicated at the atomic scale, which is called dissipation. So as you're sliding, you can really imagine sliding in any way you like, you lose energy. So you get tired if you're skating, for example. But in, in our example, we have an oscillating cantilever which loses energy to the system. And the experimentalist came to us and said, we have huge random peaks in our losses of energy and we don't understand them. They don't make any sense to us. We should have a constant loss of energy if everything's behaving well. And we actually showed that they were forming small atomically, one atomic wide chains of atoms between their tip and the surface. And they were forming them once every thousand times they came close to the surface. But the amount of energy they lost in the process was so dramatic that this dominated entirely their signal. And this was a really nice demonstration of the power of modeling. And last of all, as we move towards a biological and uh, chemical chemistry in liquids, we've also got interested in force microscopy in water, which is really the same thing, measuring the force over atoms and molecules in surfaces, but having a liquid environment, which causes a lot of problems for simulation specialists. And we were able to show here in the, the contact between a nanoparticle and a surface, and this is calcite, which you're going to hear a little bit about next because it's a very important biomineral. And we were able to show in this gray exactly the density of the water molecule. So this is the average density of the water molecules. And we can show that this completely determines the energy and forces within that system. OK, I just give one more example of something we've done in a, a little bit more detail. Um, and this is manipulation. And so when I talk about manipulation in science, uh, I'm talking about moving things on surfaces to build something. And normally we're interested in moving atoms, moving molecules, perhaps even moving clusters. The famous example in the top right, where the guys at IBM moved some metal atoms on a metal surface and they were able to form a corral trapping inside these electron density waves. This is one of the maybe most famous images 
in nanoscience. And the idea behind manipulation is that generally your particle atom molecule sits in an energy well on the surface and it's very happy and at room temperature it's not going to move from this, this trap, if you like, this, this little well that it's trapped in here. And you bring your tip close and something happens. In some cases you kick the particle or molecule, in other cases just the presence of the tip changes the nature, and you can see in the bottom left here, it changes the nature of this potential energy well and at room temperature this, this particle or molecule has enough energy to jump directly out. And if you can control this jump direction you have a manipulation, you have a controllable manipulation, you can build something on the surface. And the guys we worked with have built specific uh, nanoclusters with a specific number of atoms that have a particularly high reactivity on the surface. They've also built wires of uh, single nanoparticles between two contacts which have particular, particularly interesting conducting properties in terms of microelectronics. But I'm going to show them one more fun example and this is related to a very simple system. Sodium chloride which is a benchmark, common table salt, is a benchmark material although um, it's sort of much purer in the experiments than you get in your salt cellar. But still, even the most 99.9% .9 pure sodium chloride has impurities inside it. And so we worked with the experimentalists to try and see these impurities and play with them on the surface. So we get a crystal of sodium chloride and we cut it. Simple as that, we cut it with a big knife and we get very nice flat planes. But these planes have impurities on the surface. So our experimentalists over many, many hours we're able to find these impurities on the surface and gradually move them one by one to form a nanostructure on the surface. And you can see here eventually they end up over a period of hours building up this nanostructure and each one of those bright dots is a single at atom. And the spacing between these atoms is completely controlled by their electronic properties, their charge if you like. So a negative charge is repelled by another negative charge. And we're interested in this in terms of applications because in a way we've changed the local reactivity of the system exactly at this cross site. And I mentioned cross because immediately our experimental collaborators said that this is the, their, their nanoscale, nanoscale Swiss cross. And we said fine, it's a five nanometer Swiss cross. But we said we're in a collaboration, so we want to see some other flags. And so they went back to their data and nicely they were able to find also a Finnish flag in their data uh, but I'm greedy and also missing home every so often and I asked them could they please find a Union Jack um, but this is still a work in progress or at least as they said it's a work for me to come and do over several weeks. Okay I just move finally very quickly to show the, the theoretical modeling of this how we can understand what they did. So initially we assumed that you basically push these atoms around on the surface. So we calculated how much energy it costs to just push these atoms around on the surface. And what we found is that the tip had no influence on this. So there is no way they could manipulate this impurity on the surface using a tip. It didn't make sense. So if we couldn't manipulate it uh, just along the surface, as you might imagine the tip, what other way could we manipulate it? And so we speculated that we could just pick it up. And we actually found that the barrier to exchange this impurity with an atom in the tip was about the same at large distances but as you went closer and closer it got very small and in fact would occur easily at room temperature. And so then we know we can pick up the species from the surface, can we put it back down? I'll just give it one second. So here we ran a room temperature simulation and we found if we go very very close to the surface we can in fact deposit this impurity back into the sample. So in fact this manipulation is not pushing atoms around on the surface, it is picking them up, moving the tip away and putting them back down. And because of this difference in relative height it's completely controllable and reproducible. So you can build any types of structures you wish. Okay very briefly in the, in the last few minutes I just mentioned a few things that we're working on later. So we are, we're spending a lot of time now on microelectronics. So this is building very large models of interfaces to understand transistors with new materials. And this means we need to also develop new ways of calculating systems of thousands of atoms with very high accuracy. This earlier stuff we did in AFM water is now being expanded um, to look at solid liquid interfaces in general and this again requires that we really understand how to treat these systems with a very high accuracy. 
And finally, we're looking at molecules on surfaces. So I showed you impurities, and we've actually shown that you can template surfaces with these impurities. They assemble into islands, and these then are very sticky towards certain molecular species, and we think we can build novel electronic devices from these molecular templated systems. And just in the last slide, I would say our general aim, and I've tried to emphasize that, is that if we just stick with our current simulation techniques, we're always lagging behind experiments. And we generally aim to develop new technologies as each of the challenges, sorry, new methods as each of the challenges come to face us. And then we're very excited every so often when we really can predict something before it happens and help the, you know, with the aid of direct contact with cutting edge experiments, really aid in the design of new technologies in the future. And with that, I would just like to thank particularly many people doing the experiments, but especially Teemu Huninen in my group, who is the talented in-house artist. So, thank you.